Okay, a particle moves according to this law of motion, and we're going to say that measured in meters, that's our unit of distance. So how do you find the velocity function? Derivative. Yep. S prime of t is equal to v of t, which is 4t to the... Yes, perfect. You can take that one. That's fine. Either one. 4t to the third minus 4. So there you go. There's the velocity function. What is the velocity after two seconds? Let's plug two in. Four times two cubed minus four. So what's that? Eight times four is 32. Mm -hmm. And if we're working in meters, that would be meters per second. So that you've already done. That shouldn't be hard, right? Okay. Question B says, when is the particle at rest? So if the particle is at rest, it means it's not moving, right? Set the velocity equal to zero. So that was 4t cubed minus 4 equal to zero. Well, 4t cubed equals 4. t cubed is 1. So t is equal to 1. So after one second... The particles at rest. And did, did I say that this was, I think that for these problems we're going to assume t is always bigger than or equal to zero. Like we only have positive time, we don't have negative time. But you can kind of tell, negative time might make sense. Like if you're talking about like seconds ago perhaps. But in this, in this context we usually just say t is positive. Okay. Oh, because that finds something different. If you find v of zero, this is the velocity at start. What that means is t is zero. What's it that would be rest? No, 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 no. If you plug a number, <coughs> you plug a number in for t, that means that was the time value. So if you plug in zero for t, it means at time zero, what was the velocity? And it isn't the case that your velocity when you start, you never been kind of instantaneous, is zero. Does that make sense? So no, that finds something different. It's kind of like. Yeah. So, yeah. That's the reason why. So, when is the All right, when is the particle moving forward? So, velocity has a direction, right? And if the velocity is positive, that implies forward, right? And if velocity is negative, that implies going backwards, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to make a number line beginning from zero. This is our time. And we're going to find the sine of the velocity function. And that velocity function was 4t cubed minus 4. So just where we're at is greater than zero? Yeah, exactly. So you're really, you're solving... 4t cubed minus 4 bigger than 0. And didn't you learn to do stuff like that with a number line? Like, my, I made my pre-calc class do it that way. And you just test and see. And we did it in this class, too. Like, is it positive or negative on these intervals? And the numbers you plot on the number line usually are your zeros, right? Like, 1 is one of our zeros. The velocity is 0 at that point. So how about prior to 1? Like, say I plugged in 0.5 as a test point. So, oh goodness, 0.5, well here's a 4 times 1 half cubed minus 4. That's 4 over <coughs> 8 minus 4, right? So that's, but you don't need it, that's negative, look how it's faster than you. You had to get your calculator out and I still beat you. Ha. And past 1 on, it's going to be positive. So the particle goes backwards. from t equals 0 to t equals 1, and then forwards forever. <coughs> okay. Yes? 
Um, how did you remember just, like, put the one there? Oh, the, uh, the reason I put the one there is because that's a place where the um, velocity was zero. And we found, which we found in the previous part of the problem, right? And that's how we solved things like this. Remember when we solved things like that in pre-calc? We found the zeros and then did signs <coughs> in between the zeros. <coughs> so that's the reason. So if there was more than one zero, you'd plot the additional zeros. The additional zeros for this guy are imaginary answers, so we're not going to plot those because they don't work. Okay. Now, we're going to draw a diagram, and the idea he here is this particle <coughs> is going left to right in a horizontal motion. So how would you figure out where it starts? Into which function? The, the, original. the original. The original function. Because the original function tells you its location. The second derivative, the derivative tells you how fast it's moving and in which direction. So s of 0 is 1. So here's your number line. 0, 1. That is where your particle starts. Well, that's a coincidence, okay? The fact that the one we found in the other pro part of the problem was a value of t. It was just coincidence that both came out to be one. It was both came out to be one, yes. So start and rest should be the same thing, right? No, not necessarily, no. Okay, then after figuring out where it starts, what does it do, what does this particle do initially? Yeah, from 0 to 1, it goes back. So the question is, how far back does it go? To figure out how far back, you find f of 1. Um, because in the previous part, we had made that number line chart, and it was negative positive. Yep, that's why. <laughs> So f of 1, I believe, is 1 minus 4 plus 1 is negative 2. So we're back to negative 2, so the particle did this. So this 1 is at time equals 0. This is at time equals 1. So the thing is, we're not plotting the time on this at all. We're just plotting the position on the x-axis. So that's where it starts, and then it goes backwards. And then what happens after it goes backwards? This is when it's at rest, right? And then it turns around and goes forward. It goes forward forever, right? So the way you draw that is you just draw something like, I draw it above because it's not possible to draw it in the same place and still see it. But that's what the particle does. It goes forwards forever. And this particle only had one turnaround point because the velocity was zero in one spot. If your velocity was zero in two spots, you might go backwards, forwards, backwards again, and then go backwards forever. You could go, you could go forwards, backwards, and then forwards forever. But the places where you have to figure out where its location is are the places where the velocity is in zero, where the changing points. <coughs> so the start point you find by plugging in zero. The reason I plugged in one is because the velocity was zero there. And then I know from one on, it goes straight for every number. Okay, that's what it means. Yeah. Because of the, the result of the previous part, of the previous part of the problem. In part C, we had that chart that had the sign of the velocity function. And the velocity function was negative from 0 to 1 and positive from 1 on. And because the velocity is positive from 1 on, that means as long as you're plugging in t's that are bigger than 1, your velocity is positive, which means the particle is going forwards. Okay, sorry, I'm just going to give the elevator shaft a dirty, dirty eye. Okay, and the total distance traveled in the first 8 seconds. So going back to that picture we had, we began at 1, right? We went back to negative 2. That was time equal 0. This was time equal 1, right? 
So how many units from t equals 0 to t equals 1, how many units? Three. Went three units. Okay. We care about eight seconds. How would you figure out where this thing is at at eight seconds? Plug, did you put t, you said t equals eight, right? Yeah. So now I want your calculator. <coughs> Plug in t equals eight. From t equals one to t equals eight. We're gonna need like a dividey thing. Probably gonna be huge. Uh, 4,065. It is huge. Okay, so you go backwards and then you go forwards to that spot. So, how many units is it from negative 2 to 465? That was 4,065. Oh, 4,065. Thank you. So, how many units did it travel? 4,065. I think seven. And I'm pretty sure that I'm right. Because this 4,065 counts how many units past zero, doesn't it? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, so you have, you go, you go backwards one, two, three steps, right? And then you go forwards one, two when you're at zero. So it's two things to zero plus 4,065. That's why it's 4,067. Does that make sense? And those thirst, yes, yes, yes. So these three combine. So the total, those two combine, is 4,070. I think we said they were feet. Yes. Yeah, this came from plugging in eight into the original. Because plugging times into the original tells you their position, where they're located. Yes. Have questions like yes, you will have questions like this. This is the question on your quiz tomorrow. Okay, I promise. You know, just because, yeah, I do. I don't do it because I do it because I have to, not because in, I'm not going to torture you stuff you don't have to do in general. But yes, you do have to do stuff like this. I'll, I'll make the numbers smaller. I'll ask you the first two seconds. I believe you can plug two into that function. Can you, can you over why two to that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just a counting argument. So you got one, two, three units, right? Mm -hmm. And then you have to think that this 4,065 that Dylan found means that from zero up to there is 4,065. My name is Devin. I don't know why I called you. I don't know why I called you Dylan, but your name begins with a D, doesn't it? Yes. Devin. Yes. I don't know. Happens. I teach hundreds of students. I forget names. So one, one, and then 4,065. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then you just add them together. Okay. Yep. You really, it's really a, you plot where it's at, and the numbers you found in the previous part of the problem tell you what to plot. So you always plot time equals zero, which is where you begin. And then the other number we plot is the place where the velocity <coughs> is zero. And then the reason we plot at eight is I told you to plot eight. But if it was a quiz question, I would say plot t equals two. Let's actually do that for kick, just for kicks. And then you added three more for the total? Well, yeah, because... But didn't you account for those two earlier? When you got 67? What does distance travel mean? Really? There's, you're, you're not... Okay, so what happened here is I was in one spot. I went backwards and realized I really wanted to go forwards. The total distance traveled means how many spaces did you march? So the thing is, this, okay. this is marched twice. Right? So you have to account for that. <coughs> That's what the picture is helpful for. It lets you see that, okay, I have doubled, I have gone over that part of the path twice. Yeah. So you just said position at the end, my position at the beginning, it tells you the displacement. It doesn't tell you the particle went backwards and forwards. It just tells you that, okay, I was beginning here, ended there. But I mean, so, so I ran this morning, I ran 10 miles. If I did my begin position minus my end position, it would be zero because I went back home, right? That is not the distance I traveled. So you didn't run very far today. I didn't run very far today. I mean, like, I, I, because my <coughs> displacement was nothing. But it was, you know, it was a big loop. A couple outbacks. 
Well, I think running on a treadmill is just an exercise in futility. Oh, I hate treadmills. I never touch them, ever. No. I'll run at minus 40 before I run on a treadmill. Treadmills suck. But that's how you plot. Do you understand the general premise? premise? Start, velocity zero, and then the number given. So let's just, for kicks, what if I said during the first two seconds, <coughs> what would the position at two be? Because this one you could figure out. S of two is... 16 minus 8 plus 1, right? So that's 9. Okay. So you're at 9 at t equals 2 seconds. So how many units is that? How many units did they travel? They went 1, 2, 3, right? 4, 5, plus 9. So 14, right? So 9 is actually average model is correct assumption. For total. For total, yep, exactly. Okay. <coughs> On this question, I chose to assign number one because the rest of them, like, there's so much other tedious crap in it, like, it's number one on purpose. That was not a typo. Okay. You throw a ball in the air, and its initial velocity is 80 feet per second, and this is its height after t seconds. What is the velocity after two seconds? So V of T is S prime of T, which is equal to 80 minus 32T, right? Don't they get lunch breaks at like 11? So the velocity at two seconds is 80 minus 64, or was that 16? And this says feet per second, so this is in feet per second. And actually, if you know any physics, when that number in front of the t squared is a 16, <coughs> negative 16, it means you're in feet per second. That's acceleration due to gravity is built into this. And if it was meters, it'd be negative 4.9. But we'll, we'll, do, we'll figure out where those numbers come from in this class once we know a bit more math. Okay. Um, what is the maximum height reached by the ball? So think about this. The ball goes, it goes up and it goes down, right? So over time, it goes up and it goes down. So at that point, what is the velocity? Zero. Mm -hmm. The max occurs when V of T equals zero. Technically, isn't that the vertex of the parabola? Which I made my algebra 2 kids do. I said, okay, find the vertex. Use negative b over 2a. But now you know derivatives. So you can say, okay, I know my velocity is 80. It was 80 minus 32t, right? My max happens when this is equal to 0. So 32t equals 80. t equals 80 over 32, which I believe is 10 quarters. Do you buy that? Because I top and bottom by 8? Five Just 5 halves. Yep. So after 2 and a half seconds, the ball is at its highest point. <coughs> oh, sorry. Last question. What is the maximum height? So how would you figure out the maximum height? Mm-hmm. Find S of 5 halves. And this is an instance where fractions are actually easier than decimals. It's easier to square 5 halves than square 2.5. Okay. So this is the same thing as 40 times 5, because you can divide the 80 by 2. Does that make sense? Yes, Natalie. This is still part B. Because this the question says, what is the maximum? And what we found, the five half seconds, that's when. Oh. As opposed to what. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's when it happens, but we don't know how high yet. So minus 16 times 25 quarters. Do you buy that? Okay. So 40 times 5 is 200, right? Minus, I think, 100? So the, the dividing and then it's technically the fact that multiplication is commutative because you can make five halves into one half times five. 
And it is significantly easier to first make the number smaller by dividing and then make it bigger by multiplying. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a really, really good trick. Yeah, and it, it always works. Because you can think about dividing by two as multiplying by one half, and you can change the order that you do those things because you're multiplying. I think that's something that should be focused on more in elementary school. Like, how do you do math quickly? Like, how do you play with numbers to make stuff work fast? So... Because I think myself, I didn't learn it until I started teaching math at the high school level because I had to do math fast in order to like prove myself to the high school kids. Yes? Shouldn't that be what? No, that's, that's a two. It's just a, just a crappy two. And it should be a two. Like, that's right. Because it's four times five is 20. It's just, it, was, it just looked terrible. I must have like, you know, had the pencils still touching the paper when I moved to the zeros. But I agree that it looked a bit like an 8, so that, that's my bad. Okay. Woo. Last question for example two. Okay, so what is the velocity of the ball when it is 96 feet above the ground on its way up and on its way down? So the first thing we have to figure out is when is the ball... 96 feet in the air. And think the ball does like this kind of business, right? It's 96 feet in the air at two times, right? On the way up and on the way down. So how would you figure out when that happens? Set S equal to 96. Yeah. So 96 will equal 80t minus 16t squared or 16t squared minus 80t plus 96. And I think this problem is doctored so well that you can divide everything by 16. I'm almost positive this is t squared minus that 5t plus 6. You can check your calculator, but I am pretty sure that that's true. Yeah, that's right. Okay. Can you factor this now? Mm hmm Okay, so t is equal to 2, t is equal to 3. <coughs> and t equals 2 corresponds to the way up, right? t equals 3 is the way down. Um, you want to find the velocity of the ball at these times, right? So take these and plug them into that velocity function. V of Say that again? We have V of 2.5. Oh, no, you do. We have V of 2 because we did it at top. Yeah, I think we figured out V of 2 was 16, didn't we? Yep. Yes, Natalie. It's going to be symmetric, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. The velocity is going to be equal but opposite. Yep. Do you guys see what he's saying? Because you're at, there's this symmetry to this parabola, the velocity here will be same number but opposite sign as that velocity there. So when you work out V of 3, you're going to get negative 16 feet per second. And the negative just means that at that point the ball is falling as opposed to rising. <coughs> Is that part okay? All right. All right. This is the volume of a growing spherical cell. This is the problem for all you biologists. And the radius is measured in micrometers. Find the average rate of V with respect to, this should actually say R, when R changes from five to six micrometers. So what this is saying, remember, average rate of change is like a slope of a line. So what this is saying is it's saying find V of 6, take away V of 5, and divide by 6 minus 5. So that's 4 thirds pi times 6 cubed minus 4 thirds pi times 5 cubed. And over 1, but the over 1 doesn't matter, does it? 
So that's going to be 4 pi over 3 times 6 cubed minus 5 cubed. And I don't know 6 cubed off the top of my head. I mean, it's 36 times 6, so 2, 1. That's uh, 6. 6 times 6 is 6. 3, 2, 16? Is that right? I think so. So 2, 16. I know 5 cubed is 125, but that's just memorization. So what is 2, 16 minus 125? Okay, so 4 pi over 3 times 91, and this is, okay, that's going to be 4, I think 364 pi over 3, is that right? You can think of 91 times 4 as 90 times 4 plus 1 times 4, so 36 plus 4, right? And I... I left it as a fraction because, or with the pi, because WebAssign is picky about some stuff, and it might want you to leave the pi there. Like, if it wants a decimal, it's going to ask for it explicitly, but if it doesn't ask for a decimal, it means leave the pies there. Um, the units of this is kind of weird. So, it's a volume would be measured in micrometer, which I think is that, cubed, right? What would the um, radius be measured in? Micrometer, right? It's micrometers cubed per micrometer, which reduces to, that does reduce, doesn't it? Micrometer, micrometers, micrometers, that should say squared, sorry. See, I can't think with that stupid noise. And think, this is like saying if you add a little bitty bit to the radius, how does the volume change? I think about taking an apple and dipping it in caramel. You dip an apple in caramel, you change the volume, right? But effectively, you add on a surface area because you coat the surface in, like, caramel, right? Okay. Do you get what to do from 5 to 5.1? Do you get how it would work if you had to do it? Yeah. Same thing. You just do V of 5.1 minus V of 5 over 5.1 minus 5. In this case, you get 320.484, and that'll be micrometers squared. <clears throat> okay. Find the instantaneous rate of change. Steve, you got to speak louder because of this. That's a decimal. Yep, no, it's okay. It's not your fault. I'm just, no one can hear a damn thing. Is that a decimal or 84? Yes. It's a decimal. If you plug that in a calculator, that one, it just felt like a decimal was more useful. Okay. Sorry, yes. Instantaneous rate of change. Take the derivative. So in this case, that would technically be dv dr. And it will be... 4 thirds pi r, 4 thirds pi times, what's the derivative of um, r cubed? 3 r squared. 3 r squared, yep. Or 4 pi r squared. Okay. And we care about when we have 5 micrometers specifically. So we're going to find dv dr at r equals 5. And that will equal 4 pi times 5 squared, or 100 pi, which is approximately 314, right? Notice how that's kind of close to the thing we got in part B above, right? Assuming you trust my arithmetic. Okay. All right. And the last question... It hard, seems but like you actually already did it. Show the rate of change of the volume of the surface area, volume of a sphere with respect to its radius is its surface area. So we found that dv dr was 4 pi r squared, right? This involves just knowing something, but that equation, that is the surface area of a sphere.
And the concept here that you have to think about is that if you're changing this sphere's volume by adding on a little bit to the radius, like a little bit, like a teensy weensy bit, if you add a little teensy weensy bit to the radius, you add a surface area. That's the basic idea. So if you increase <clears throat> r by a little bit, this adds a thin layer i.e. the surface area. I mean, you could think everlasting gobstopper, right? Little layers of things, and effectively whenever you add a layer of candy, you add a surface area. It officially is a volume because it has some thickness, right? But the instantaneous rate of change has no thickness, because that means that the little, that's what it means, the little r has been taken to zero. The limit is whatever goes to zero kind of thing. <clears throat> Okay, last bits. <coughs> so this is meant to have a parenthesis. Oh, I bad. It's meant to have a parenthesis before the squared. I typoed. So there is your parenthesis. Okay, this describes what happens to a tank. There's this law from physics called that must be Torricelli, must be his law. So, if you think, if you live in the cabin because we live in Fairbanks, you know, when you get your water jugs from like the water wagon, the water goes up quickest in the beginning, right? Because there's a lot of pressure and then it slows down at the end, right? So this equation just describes the stuff that happens in the middle and also accounts for that. It has the fact that the tank is a thousand gallons built in and it has the tank, the fact that that tank will empty in 20 minutes also built into the equation. Your tank was bigger or it took longer to empty, the equation would be different. Okay, find the rate at which water is draining in the tank after five minutes, 10 minutes, and 20 minutes. That means you need the derivative. Saying how fast is the water leaving the tank at this time, that means find dv dt. So d. Um, you know, those numbers appear to be like in there someplace, right? Like you see the thousand, you see the 20, right? Yeah. I suspect that that probably is the pattern that you use all the time. But I don't know enough about physics to say for sure. So that will be a thousand times two, one minus 120t to the first, because that squared is outside of the parentheses. It's the, technically the chain rule. Times a negative one over 20. Um, because when I was taking the derivative of this 1 minus, minus 120 of t to the second, I have oh, stuff to the second. The parentheses are supposed to be before the 2. That's my typo that made it look confusing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Okay. So then I think that's negative 2,000 over 20. So isn't that negative 100? <coughs> 2,000 over 20 cancel a 0. That's 100, right? Because I've got this is 2,000, right? Got that 1 20th. One. Oh, that's the chain rule. Does that make sense, though? Yep, it's okay. All right. So at t equals 5, the derivative of the inside function, 1 minus 1 20th t. So when you plug in t equals 5, you're going to get you're going to get that dv dt just trust me is minus 25. What are its units going to be? What's the volume measured in? Mhm. Mm exactly. Mhm. Mm At t equals um 10, should this number be greater than or less than the number we have right here? Technically greater because it should be a bigger a, a bigger negative. Yes. I got negative 50. That doesn't make any sense. The first one is 75. Yeah, I'm so sorry. Don't trust me. I'm, I'm not trustable. The first one is minus 75. The second one is minus 50. That one I'm, I believe. I know, I know. Isn't that horrible? It's so terrible. 
shame me. Can I blame it on the noise? At 20, if the tank is empty at 20, what should the volume be? And it ends up working out to be zero. And that one's not hard to convince yourself of, right? When you plug in 20, negative 1, 20 times 20 makes negative 1. 1 minus 1 is 0. 0 is off to negative 100. That's also gallons per minute. So when is the water flowing out fastest? Not of these, but of all the possible times. Mm -hmm. So at t equals 0 would be the fastest. Um, when is it flowing out the slowest? At t equals 20. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and at that, for those things, that actually is common sense, unlike other things people say are common sense and really aren't common sense. <coughs> like, if you've ever had a tank drain water, fastest than the getting slowest at the end. So. Yeah, or your coffee tank. But that's being helped by something, so. What's that? Well, common sense, you can figure it on your own. Common knowledge is something you assume. Yes, that's, that's a really good distinction. Okay. <coughs> so one application to economics of calculus, all the stuff, you I assume you to take economics in high school at some point. I didn't, none of it made any sense when I took it because it was all these marginal whatevers, and I was like, what do they mean? I don't get it. Well, marginal functions are actually derivatives. They're rates of change of various functions. So the marginal cost function, if you have a function c of x that describes your cost of making x units of something, c prime of x is called the marginal cost. And its units would be dollars per unit. And that's because C of X is usually measured in dollars because it's a cost and X is how many or you know of whatever, how many boats, how many boxes, how many coffee cups, how many things, stuffs. Okay. So that's what a marginal cost function, and then marginal revenue is the derivative of the revenue function. So I mean, that's where those functions come from. And they can tell you how your cost per unit is changing. Like if you first started making teddy bears, because you know teddy bears are fun, your cost per teddy bear is really high because so you've got to buy your equipment, right? But as you start to make more and more teddy bears, the cost per teddy bear goes down because you're spreading those initial costs out over more stuff. And then eventually your equipment wears out and it gets expensive again because you've got to buy new stuff. Right? Or you gotta pay more employees overtime. That's what'll make marginal revenue do stuff. Okay. So find this marginal cost function. So that just says C prime of X. And that's a uh, 12 minus 0 0.2 X plus, and oh, it's good to review multiplying decimals. So with this and that, you do, I learned three times five makes 15. And you move the decimal back as many places as you have accounted for there, right? Just four spots. So it goes back one, two, three, four. Did you guys learn it that way too? I don't think so. You guys are younger than, some of you are younger. Like I know you're probably younger than I am, so you learned it differently than I did because they did this whole new math thing that made math make less sense. You noped out of that one. Okay, but in general, if you have a number times a decimal, look at the just, pretend like the decimal doesn't exist for a, just for a second. Multiply the five and the three, that makes 15. And you've got to account for the fact that there were one, two, three, four places. So move it back from the 15, one, two, three, four places. That's the general pattern. X squared. So C prime of X is 12 minus 0 0.2 X plus 0.15x squared. And that's actually one bad thing about calculators. If you, ever, if you always use calculators, you never like look for or notice those patterns unless you're actually trying, and it's really easy to check out. I saw kids do 2 squared in a calculator, and I was like, seriously, what's wrong with you? It's faster to just do it in your head. 
This is silly. <clears throat> okay, find a C prime of 200. So just take that equation, plug in 200. When we do this, we're going to get 32. Okay, and in this case, my x is yards and my c is cost. So what are the units of this thing? Other dollars per yard. So this tells you when you are making 200 yards of fabric, the cost per yard is increasing at $32 per yard. That is punch 200 into the... Um, derivative equation. Okay. Yep, and I mean, this is that, that unit calculator for. I mean, you technically could probably do it without it if you were really good decimals. It really isn't that bad, but that's probably not the thing to focus on right now. Okay. So compare C prime of 200 with the cost of manufacturing the 201st yard of fabric. So the question for this is how would you figure out how much making that like next yard of fabric costs? Does that make sense? Like how would you figure that out? What you do is you find the cost of making all 201. And if you want to separate out the cost of just that last yard, what would you subtract? The cost of the first 200. And that tells you the price of the last yard. But in the original, not the... But in the original, yep, exactly. This will give you something in dollars. Yeah, because it isn't saying rate of change, it's just saying how much does making that next yard of fabric cost you? Just one more. And they're going to be awfully close together. So you don't have to do over. And you, if you had to do, no, you don't do over, definitely. Nope, there's, I mean, I have over 201 minus 200 in my notes, but I don't think, you don't need that for anything here because, first of all, it would be one. And second of all, if you needed the cost for the 202 yards of fabric, you want to know, like, the last two, so you wouldn't want to divide by two. But they, they chose one more because then the denominator would be one. And you can compare this number to the previous number, and they're going to be awfully similar. The only thing I'll tell you that when you do this and you use a calculator to figure it out, make sure you put – that's not important, but the second thing must actually be in parentheses. Otherwise, you're going to get something really wrong. And this number on your homework when you work out these questions should be awfully close to what you got in the previous answer. They should be pretty close together. In this case, it works out to be 32.00, oh, sorry, God, crap, can't read, 32.2005, maybe dollars. So making one more yard of fabric costs just over $32 more. Yes? So you subtracted from the original, but is this comparison? Yeah, and that's the compare. So cost of making... 201 yards, cost of making 200. And the comparing thing is that this is close, right? Mm -hmm. To the marginal cost. So I don't remember how economics was explained in high school because it was like 12 years ago, 13 maybe, can't count anymore. But the cost of the instantaneous rate of change of the cost, how quickly cost is going up or going down, is almost the same as increasing how much you're making by one. <coughs> They're close. This is kind of like an average rate of change versus an instantaneous rate of change, isn't it? Very, very similar. And that's what they mean by compare. The point is that they're showing you that they are really, really, really similar. It's how much you'd add to your cost if you just made one more. That's what I was asking. Okay, great.